Mexico. Here's my outline. First, I'll talk about background and objective. Then, I'll pre present my approaches and result. Finally, summary and conclusion. The Gulf of Mexico has experienced two of the largest accidental oil spills in history. It is also highly polluted by oil tankers. So here's a global map of oil spill from oil tankers. The darker the color, the more polluted. Besides this anthropogenic oil spill, the Gulf of Mexico has also widely distributed natural oil seeps, concentrated in the western Gulf of Mexico. Natural seeps have limited impact. While massive oil spill into the ocean may cause severe damage to the environment, oil is toxic to multi-levels of food chain and can contaminate shorelines and form sedimentation to the ocean floor. So this may cause long-term impact to the benthic ecosystem. To facilitate mitigation and post-spill assessment, so several important questions need to be answered. First, where's the oil? How much oil has been released? So what natural resources are impacted and for how long? To answer all these questions, all need information of oil location and quantity. This you will obtain from AUVs, shapes, air boom, and satellite. AUVs are inward environments. It's not my focus. Shape measurements are accurate, but limited in coverage. Air booms are efficient for small spills, also limited in coverage and high cost. Satellite remote sensing survey large areas and physically inaccessible areas, provide repeatable and standardized data, which will provide important information of oil location, extent, and other supportive information for oil spill response, mitigation, and post-spill assessment. The most frequently used satellite techniques are from synthetic aperture radar and optical remote sensing. This, is a, this slide shows oil presence absence statistic from Deepwater Horizon oil spill by SAR and by MODIS. So the derived oil footprint and the oil frequency distribution patterns agree well by these two techniques. So both, these two, both SAR and optical remote sensing are very good at obtaining this oil presence absence statistics. <coughs> This table shows a detailed comparison between SAR and optical remote sensing. SAR satellites, including radar set and others, SAR measures surface roughness. So oil slick on the ocean surface, depth in capillary waves and short gravity waves, reduces the SAR, reduces the radar backscattering coefficient. This will result in a dark spot on satellite SAR image. While optical remote sensing, including sensors of MODIS, WEARS, CZCS, Landsat, MSI, and Worldview, it measures spectral reflectance. So anything that changes spectral reflectance, that will be measured by optical remote sensing. SAR and optical remote sensing have their own pros and cons. SAR usually have a higher spatial resolution, a smaller footprint, and long revisit period. While optical remote sensing usually have lower resolution, larger footprint, and shorter revisit period. SAR measures in microwave, so it's cloud free. While optical remote sensing measures in visible wavelength and short wave infrared, so it's cloud opaque. SAR usually costs high, while optical remote sensing low to no cost. So most importantly, SAR is primarily used for oil detection. It is very hard for SAR to quantify oil volume and to differentiate from false positives. Here, false positive mean, so I detect oil slick, but the detect thing is actually not oil, so that's wrong. Another concept is false negative. So there's oil slick in this location. I didn't detect it, so I thought there's no oil slick in this location. That's also wrong. So going back to the slides, Optical remote sensing shows the potential to quantify oil volume and to differentiate from false positives. So as can be seen, 
So within the slick, there's a little contrast in the star image. So why in the, in the MODIS image, within the slick, there's different colors and gradient. But how to interpret this information is quite difficult. So here comes my objective of this dissertation. So first is to understand the oil, water, spatial, and spectral contrast in optical image. Second, so based on the spatial and spectral contrast to develop algorithms to detect and quantify surface oil using multiband satellite image. The third, using the above understanding and methods to assess oil spill accidents. First is to understand the oil water spatial and spectral contrast. Optical detection of oil spill based on two principles. The first is oil's optical property is different from water. This is the absorption coefficient of crude oil and water. So in short wavelengths, crude oil absorption coefficient is several magnitude higher than water. And this coefficient exponentially decay toward longer wavelength. So crude oil also features this carbon hydrogen bond absorptions in the short wave infrared. The second principle is intersangling. So sunglint is the specular reflection of sunlight. Because the sea surface is not perfectly flat, the rough surface will reflect sunlight into many angles, not just one. So the presence of oil slick on the ocean surface dampens the surface waves. Thus, we will modulate the reflected sunlight that can be measured by the optical sensor. By this means, oil slick can be detected under sunglint. To further study oil's optical properties contribution to reflectance, I have this oil reflectance experiment by the seawall at USF. So I put no volume of crude oil and oil emulsion into these two identical black tanks and measure the reflectance spectra using a spectrometer. So oil emulsion here, the emulsification process is a weathering process that water gets entrained into oil in forms of small water droplets. By taking up water, stable oil emulsion could have water content of 60% to 80%, substantially increase volume and viscosity, reduces the evaporation and biodegradation process. So here's the crude oil spectra. The thickness here was calculated by using input volume divided by tank area. So when oil thickness is really thin, oil reflectance is actually higher than water because of the refrenial reflection. So when oil thickness reaches 5 microns or thicker, so oil reflectance is lower than water in the visible wavelengths. With increased oil thickness, the reflectance decreases. So this, there's little contrast in the near infrared and short wave infrared. Emotion. So the mixing of water oil droplets enable very high scattering. Showed in the reflectance spectra is the elevated reflectance in red, near infrared, and short wave infrared band. So with increased oil thickness, the reflectance also increases in this wave, in these bands. So because of the high viscosity, the oil emulsion did not spread evenly in the tank. So this increased reflectance is a result of both increased thickness and increased area coverage. Another experiment is in AMSAT. AMSAT is a national oil spill response test facility it features this 20 meter by 200 meter outside solid water tank. So the experiment was desired to put no volume of oil into these six meters and 1.6 meter squares in order to create pure oil pixels with no oil thickness on satellite image if oil spread evenly in these squares. <coughs> 
However, when the water view to satellite oil pass, so the oil washed out of these squares, and some of the remaining oil was pushed on one side because of the strong wind. So anyway, so by on-site observation, I still know the relative thickness of these captured oil slicks. By diagnosing the reflectance spectral of World View 2, same trend has been found. With increased oil thickness, the reflectance decreases. So these are all outside experiments. Previous study has also measured the reflectance thickness relationship in the lab environment for crude oil and for oil emulsions. The result here agree with the USF tank experiments. USGS has used this elevated reflectance and the carbon hydrogen absorption features to map and quantify oil emulsion by using hyperspectral airborne average data. So this hyperspectral algorithm, however, cannot be applied to, more, to satellite image because satellite image are usually multiband, lack this band information to apply the hyperspectral algorithm. So secondly, so satellite image are usually under some extent of sunglint. Sunglint distorts the reflectance spectra. The second principle for oil detection is inner sunglint. So inner sunglint conditions. So oil water spatial contrast can be enhanced. So my first question, so how much sunglint is required for oil film detection? So inner sunglint conditions, oil would either show positive or negative contrast with water. Come, here comes my second question. I want to know is there a relationship with sunglint strength and the oil water contrast? To answer this question, thin oil film from natural oil sip location in the western Gulf of Mexico was studied. This is to minimize the reflectance signal from oil's optical properties. The sunglint strength here was calculated by Cox and Monk model with the input of wind speed and solar wheel geometry. The first question, sunglint requirements for detecting oil film was determined using CMD image pairs over the same location. So here's a modis image that detected oil slicks. But the CMD, the weirs image that si captured six minutes later does not detect oil slicks. So it was because the sunglint strength here does not favor for oil detection. Another example, so MODIS does not detect any oil slicks, but oil slick was detected in the same wares. After examining more than 2,000 satellite images, I come up with statistical results. The x-axis of this histogram is image count. The y-axis is the sunken strength. So the red bar here means under this sunken strength, oil was detected by modis terror. The blue bar here means under this sunken strength, oil was not detected by modis terror, but was detected by the same day wears or modis aqua. So here, the sunken thresh threshold for modis terror has been determined for 10 to the minus 5 to 10 to the minus 6. The same threshold has been determined for modis aqua. So for years, the threshold is 10 to a minor 6 to 10 to a minor 7. So with this sunken threshold, with sunken strength greater than 10 to the minus 5, oil slick can always be detected. <coughs> when sunken strength lower than 10 to the minor 6, oil slick can never be detected. This is for oil films. So by quantifying this sunken threshold, the false negative detection can be significant, significantly reduced. So here comes the second question. 
the sunken strength relationship with oil water contrast. So under cer certain sunken strengths, the oil water contrast was calculated by oil reflectance, subtract water reflectance in the Moody's 859 nanometer band. So from the sunken threshold, we know that when sunken lower than 10 to the minus 6, there is no contrast between the two. So with increase the sunken strength, oil first show negative contrast with water, and then shift to positive contrast when sunken strength greater than 0 0.025. To with higher sunken strength, the positive contrast is higher. So when sunken strength less than 10 to the minus 3, the sunken negative contrast is, is very small. It's less than 0 0.01. It's much smaller than the elevated reflectance by oil emulsion in near IR band. So after quantifying this sunken threshold and studying by using a field experiments, so the oil water spatial and spectral contrasts are studied. So the next step is to using the spatial and spectral contrast to develop algorithm to detect and quantify oil. So first is to, uh, is to detect oil slick. So for, from previous slides, so the spatial and spectral contrast can be used to detect oil slick in the sunken conditions or by oil's optical property. So here shows uh, oil slick that captured by Landsat in the MC20 site in northern Gulf of Mexico. First, I'll give a rough region of interest to include this oil slick. So then, every pixel in the ROI will be compared with the nearest reference water. If the reflectance, the pixel reflectance, is different from the reference waters, it will be identified as a spatial anomaly. So next step is to differentiate this spatial anomaly from false positives. Take, take sargassum as an example. Sargassum mat on the ocean surface looks very like oil emulsions. But sargassum features this chlorophyll absorption in 670 nanometers, while oil emulsion does not have these absorption features in this band. So by spectral diagnose, the false positives can be rolled out. So after going through all the pixels in the region of interest, the oil slick features can be extracted now. So the next step is to quantify the extracted oil, oil features. So from the USF tank experiments, the crude oil and oil emulsion reflectance responses very differently to increased oil thickness. So I will use different methods to quantify crude oil and oil emulsions. Now the first step is to classify oil emulsion in non-emulsion. I use this three-band false color composite to identify oil emulsion. So this is a Landsat image captured during Deepwater Horizon oil spill and the sunken conditions. And this is an average image that captured four hours later without sunken. So in this false color composite, oil emulsion either show this brownish color or green color regardless of sunken. In the reflectance spectra, this green group here refers to the oil emulsion or the green colors. This red group here refers to the brownish color emulsions. And the blue here are water. In addition to the elevated reflectance in the IR and the sphere, so oil emulsion either shows a peak reflectance in the sphere band or in the near IR band. Same feature has been found for, uh, for non-glint no conditions. So 
this unique feature of all your emotions was used to classify emotion. After emotion was identify, identified, then is to quantify the emotion thickness. So first, under no green conditions. The average image was under no green conditions, and I used the average sphere to blue band ratio to serve as a relative thickness index. So this RTI here was found to have a significant relationship with the USGS derived thickness from the hyperspectral algorithm. So any noggling conditions, this developed relationship here can be applied to land set and other multiband image, which have the required band set. So how about inner sunkling condition? So sunkling will increase reflectance parallelly across the band. So this RTI is still an indication of relative thickness. While if you add same value to the numerator and denominator, this, this value actually change. So this developer relationship here cannot be applied to any sunkling condition. So then, inner sunkling conditions, I made the assumption that the emotion thickness frequency distribution does not change between Landsat and Alvarez. This assumption is consistent with the popular rule of thumb that is used by the community, where thick oil is located in 10% of the oil footprint, but it contains 90% uh, of the oil volume. Here is the average derived oil thickness histogram. By forcing the RTI histogram from ETM plus to match this thickness histogram, so a relationship between thickness, in, between thick RTI and the thickness has been established under the sunkling conditions. So using the relationship, the oil emotions was estimated here, emotion thickness. Apply the same assumption to other Landsat images during deepwater horizon oil spill under different sunkling conditions. Now we have these multiple models that relate thickness to RTI, relate RTI to thickness and the varying sunkling conditions. Now, given a multiband image, by using RTI and looking up for models of nearest sunkling conditions and interpolation, all emotion thickness can be derived. This flowchart summarizes the oil detection, classification, and thickness quantification scheme. So I'll go step by step. So every pixel in the ROI will be compared with the nearest water. If it is, diff if it is different from water, it will be identified as special anomaly. By ruling out false positives, the identified oil pixel will be classified as oil emotion and non-emotion. For oil emotion, using RTI and models lookup and interpolation, both glint and no glint conditions, so emotion thickness can be derived. <coughs> I'll briefly introduce how non emotion was estimated here. So first, sunkling check by using the derived, derived sunkling threshold. If any no sunkling conditions, using RTI to estimate relative thickness. So if any sunglint, first classify the oil slick by his spatial contrast with water. If in negative contrast, it will be classified as thin. If in positive contrast, it will be classified as thick oil. Then use RTI to estimate the relative thickness of the thick oil class. So instead of estimating emotion thickness, only relative thickness was estimated here. So finally, results output. So here shows the, the result of the classification scheme. So oil emotion thickness was estimated. For non-emotion, 
Noise motion was classified as thin and thick, and the relative thickness or thick uh, over the thick oil class. After understanding the oil's spatial and spectral contrast and using the new developed algorithm, so I can access oil spill accidents. The first case is for MC20 oil spill. So the MC20 site was 17 kilometers offshore Mississippi River Delta. So the platform and the connected wheels were damaged by Hurricane Yvonne in 2004, September. So subsequent oil leaking was found, and this oil spill has not been stopped yet. So this is an oil cumulative footprint derived from the more than 11 years satellite image. Oil was more frequently found around these platform locations in a northeast, southwest direction pattern. So this oil frequency distribution pattern here agree with the river plume dynamics, which features either northeast current or southwest current in these locations. Second is for the oil presence frequency. In 2004, no cloud-free images detect oil slick in this location. In 2005, it's 40%. 2006 to 2011, about 70% of the cloud-free images detect oil slick in this location. 2010 was omitted to avoid confusion from deep water horizon oil spill. In 2012 to 2016, this percentage has increased to more than 80%. So the average oil coverage area was estimated to be 15 square kilometers per image, including all cloud-free images. Using this area and oil thickness divided by the resident time that determined from model result in the natural seep locations by previous study. So with the input parameters upper bound and lower bound in the tables, so this average oil discharge rate was estimated to be 50 to 17 US barrels per day. So even with this very conservative lower bound estimation, 50 US barrels per day is much, much larger than claim from the company who own this platform. You know how much they estimated? So two to three gallons per day. The second case, the Exoc oil spill. Exoc oil spill footprint here was delineated. After examining these many images and rolling out false positives, the oil footprint over the entire spill period has been generated. So before this, before this map, our knowledge of the Exoc oil footprint was based on the physical modeling results. So this new knowledge here was used to help determine sediment uh, sampling location for sea image, sea image crews. The third case is the oil, oil spill from oil tanker clearance in East China Sea in early 2018. So I used a high speed high spatial resolution MSI to map these oil slicks from the oil tankers. The mapped slick area is much larger than reported from airborne and shipborne surveys. Oil emulsions also detect within the slicks. But before that, people thought there would be no thick oil from these accidents. Because the condensate oil, they think will evaporate very fast.
So in summary, the Sangren impact has been quantified with Sangren threshold determined for oil film detection. The Sangren range has been determined for oil volume quantification. So oil slick now can be detected using multiband image by spatial and spectral contrast. A stepwise classification scheme has been proposed. The exact oil spill uh, footprint map for the entire spill period has been generated. The MC20 average oil discharge rate estimated to be 50 to 1700 US barrels per day. So oil emulsion has been detected from oil tanker clearance in East China Sea. So in conclusion, we now have this improved understanding of oil water spatial and spectral contrast in the different observing conditions. A stepwise scheme is developed to delineate oil slick, classify oil type, and quantify oil thickness for multiband satellite image. For future spills, we can not only tell oil footprint, but also provide oil quantity information at given locations. So during deep water horizon oil spill, the federal agencies like NOAA simply using the oil presence absence map to facilitate oil, uh, oil spill mitigation. So now I can provide more detailed information about different type of oil and oil thickness information. Looking forward, so I will follow on to refine and improve the classification scheme. So secondly, so one of the extremely difficult problems for oil spill research is lack of direct field validation. So actually, none of the remote sensing results has been validated by direct field measurements. To address this question is a critical need for remote sensing or oil spills. This will require not only an accurate measurement or oil thickness in the field, but also a coordinate sampling to match the remote sensing pixel is critical important. Because the remote sensing pixel is usually large, in meters, your tens of meters, and hundreds of meters, especially oil slick is patchy on the ocean surface. So I will fo also follow on these directions on my future research. So with that, I would like to thank my advisor, Dr. Chuan Minghu. Thank you for your support throughout my degree. Committee members, thank you for your guidance. To my co-authors and colleagues from CNH and Gomery, so partner working in the field. Also, I want, thank, I want to thank the amazing optical oceanography lab. Thank you for all your help and a happy time together. So this dissertation is funded by NASA Earth and Space Science Fellowship, the Indoor Fellowship from College of Marine Science, the Lake Fellowship, and the Wells Fargo Fellowship. It is also supported by CNH and Gomery. I also want to thank Water Mapping, Bessie, and ExxonMobil for support of the experiments. So here are my publications during my PhD study. So with that, I would like to take questions. Okay, we'll now open it up for questions. Yep. Down to barrel. <laughs> in barrel, about 42. Got it. Yep. So this is just a basic question about definition. Uh -huh. When you talked about emulsion versus crude oil. Uh -huh. Is there any kind of um, intermediate change, or is it a very distinct change? Because when you talked about your 90-10 rule, you talked about a very concentrated area, and then it gets very <coughs> uh, diluted further away. Does some of that convert to emulsion? I don't fully understand the definitions between the emulsion versus, say, crude oil, and how they may interact with each other. So emulsion is a uh, is there's, there's water content into the emulsion. So emulsion can be like 10% uh, water content to 
ninety percent of water, water content. So, so within this water content within the oil, that is emulsion. But stable emulsions means that um, when stable emulsion form, it cannot be easily to return to crude oil. If it's not stable, so oil water was incorporated into emulsion, and then after exposed for without energy and also after exposed, so we will go back to crude oil. So there's no, I think the, the, the difference is the water content. If you have water inside, that's emulsion. Yep. So that 90-10 will, as you get further away from the source, you're more likely to find more emulsion? Is that fair uh, to say, or you don't know? Yes. So um, oil emulsions, um, the formation of oil emulsions is not like a clearly, it's, it's, it's not a material, but people think that, um, so the important factor is uh, energy. So by breaking waves and other things, and uh, also exposed to sunlight and UV light. So, so close to the well site is, is mostly fresh oil, but uh, away, so you will find more emotions. Yep. Yep. Hey, so uh, your blend coefficient, when you're setting the threshold for like what, where you can and cannot see mm -hmm. oil in motors and gears and so forth, like mm -hmm. your blend coefficient will change over an image, you know, you select. Yes. How did you, you know, what value did you use uh, as the, you know, the threshold for an individual image? You say, I can see it in this one and this is the blend coefficient for an image, but there is no blend coefficient for a full image. Uh, yes. So. So for each image, so each pixel will have a green coefficient. Correct. So, so if there's a, the, the pixel's green coefficient is less than the threshold, so I will not consider this pixel. So it's a pixel based. It's not a, like an image based. Do I understand your question? Yep. 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 There. Um, so your 90%, the, the percentage there, and then the 10% is, is spread out. Um, just for my own ignorance, um, do you have a relative idea since you're only detecting the sea surface, how much oil gets released at the at a bottom makes it to that sea surface? And once it makes an emulsion, how much of that percentage of that oil stays in the emulsion detectable at the sea surface and how much is mixed into the water column? Or is this all dependent on wind waves and everything else? So actually I don't know the answer of that. Yeah, but the situation depends. Like in the deep water horizon oil spill, is it in deep water? There's a there's a, a oil plume intrusion in the deep water. So, but if it is in shallow water, so most of the oil would like uh, into the surface. So, so for oil emulsion, um, like uh, friction, like a percentage with uh, crude oil, I don't know. Yep, uh, so you said that your um, your ACOP maps were used to inform what Gomery is going to tell us. No. Oh yes. Did, they, did your maps comport with what they found in their method samples? I know there's a lot of time lag between those uh, those events. But. Or seeing it, sorry. Uh, so so did they find oil where you said there would there was surface oil? Us. Uh, so the sea meter will take the sediment cores and they, they find the oil uh, in the sediment. So uh, a layer of oil in the sediment. In every location or some of them? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had a question. Uh -huh. Regarding the MC20 uh -huh. uh, oil uh, spill, you'd, you'd estimated 1,700 barrels of oil a day in terms of leakage. And if that's right, that would mean more or less the equivalent of Deepwater Horizon in about five years in terms of volume of oil. Do I get that right? 1,700 barrels a day in five years is about 3 million barrels of oil, which is about what the Deepwater Horizon spill is. So is that? Uh, but this, that is uh, upper bound. OK. Yeah. So mostly I would, I would not like to claim this many I usually want to be conservative. 
So, but but actually, is if it's like uh, 100 to 200 barrels per day, is equivalent to a depolarized oil spill, because if you don't stop this uh, oil leaking, it will be continued for what basically estimated continue for 100 years. So, it's so pretty much similar. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, of course. So for, the, for those natural oil seeps, they have this uh, ecosystem and also have the uh, the for those natural oil seeps, they have this ecosystem and also have the bio uh, bacteria that can consume those uh, natural oil seeps. So that's why if happen if a massive oil spill happens in the deep water horizon oil spill, like like a deep water horizon oil spill, the existing uh, bacteria would consume some of the oil and they grow very uh, very quickly. So that's one of the advantages to have the natural oil seeps in those Gulf of Mexico. So, yep. yep. You know, we end by so forth. Thank you. Um, along these lines, I just want to ask, since you, your research has kind of been challenging, you know, the volume for the trailer platform mm -hmm. or the weathering patterns for the spill in these kind of seas, how do you find your research has been accepted, you know, by the oil industry or the government in terms of incorporating it? Well, that's a really tough question. <laughs> uh, so, Dr. Dave Plangers, my committee member, he continues asking me. So, mm -hmm. so, so, what's the practice use? You ask yourself, what's the practice use of this? Um, your techniques that can be applied to the remote to the response. So. So currently, my classification scheme is uh, so I can do within two hours. But um, they said that two hours is not enough. So I will improve and uh, refine my classification scheme. Um, so for mitigation efforts, at least, so now I can provide more information with the uh, uh, thickness and different class of oil compared to other agencies like uh, NOAA. So that's the additional. I may. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> it, it is relative. It is. It, 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 and it's based on, it, it is well received, and it's based on needs uh, that are, tend to be ongoing during a response. So it, it, I try to say two hours is a challenge, and we're going to deploy 54 vessels to the site. Um, so limiting that to our window is going to help those aspects, but certainly long term, and the MC20 trailer platform is a great example of how do we look at long term cumulative impacts, because um, this is the only real way of doing it. And the tighter refinement of those of those volume estimates is going to go a long way, and ultimately lead to a nice resource balance question. Along those lines, are you able to differentiate between the trailer oil and you know other like used for discharges and tankers in the area? No. no, so I cannot uh, tell uh, different types of like crude oil or diesel. Uh, no. So your estimate is a lovely range between 15 to 17 acres. Yes. Yeah. So what is the range that you have in mind for the estimate? Yes. Yes, this large rent is because I use uh, so I use a thick and to thin oil ratio, like using a rule of thumb. I have ten percent. Here is five percent of thick oil and ninety-five percent of thin oil from a study from deep water horizon oil spill, and I use a thick oil range and a thin oil range. And thin oil range here is uh, from uh, zero point zero four microns to five microns. So it's two orders magnitude. So that's why the those uh, range is so large. So to like to validate this act this if it's accurate, 
I think, um, so um, my committee member, Ian MacDonald, has, um, has now going through this, uh, just get back from uh, MC20 sign and using this multi beam sonars to measure this uh, plume rate. So I think that will be a good comparison between the surface and uh, downward from the source. Yep. Well, if you're going to take my name, uh, <laughs> <laughs> what in the world could, could create a three order of magnitude? I'm not talking about what you're seeing in the remote sensing images, mm -hmm. but this oil is coming from somewhere. Mm -hmm. And it's being presented to the to the ocean seafloor and then to the surface via some mechanism. Mm -hmm. What possible mechanism could explain a two order of magnitude difference in the output of this well? How do we set it? Up? So can you repeat the question? What possible mechanism uh -huh. could explain a two order of magnitude range, or actually a three order uh -huh. of magnitude range, for the output from this system? Um. I mean, putting aside what you're seeing on the surface, yep. what, what geology could support that? What what well engineering could support that kind of a variability? Is this typical of um, uh, production platforms in the Gulf of Mexico to see this big a, a, a variation day day in and day out? As so, from my per perspective, so so the the coming out might be stable. It so this difference or range, or I, I see the difference or area, may be a result of the wind or, uh, and the waves. <coughs> so from the geology. But you're talking about oil discharge rate. Yep. Not wind rate. Yep, yep, yep. So from the geology thing, I can't um, think of. What about your, your oil frequency change over time? That's, that's that, I, that is a really impressive number there. So that looks like it's increasing. Is there any geology or information about wells or reservoirs in this part of the world that would explain that? Because hmm. it looks, certainly looks like you're getting more oil out of this system. Hmm. So is that part of this range or? Uh, so the range here is, it's not necessary to be uh, really uh, relevant to this uh, frequency. But to answer the frequency here, so my, so what I can think of is might be the, the bloom, the, the, the fracture um, from the oil source to the, to the bottom. So the, the fracture may change. Like um, you have a large pressure pushing outside, so the fracture may enlarge or something. oscillating back and forth between these two large numbers, or between these two numbers, correct? I mean, I this is more of a related to your uncertainty. And once you can refine that, maybe you'll get a more accurate rate. But this is so large orders of magnitude. Yes, that's, that's correct. Okay. That's correct. And, and the second question I have is, what happened after 2010, maybe this is what was being alluded to, that occurred that might, have, might be responsible for an increase of seepage? Were some of the wells shut down at, at some point after the oil spill? The deep oil spill wells. I don't know. I'm just asking out of curiosity. <laughs> um, so for this one year of decrease, so if there's a like a, a few years decrease, I would say there's a trend or something. But uh, for this one year, as so I I can't like um, attribute it with something uh, extra efforts on it. It will. Yeah. Yep. So, so, so there may be a climatic factor in those frequency numbers. Yep. Yep. Um, and this this frequency is like uh, average twenty six images per year. So, but it's it's fluctuating. Yep. But just the percent of cloud free images, 
not the percent of all of you, right? So it's like some years we'll have 26, some years we'll have 30, but either way, the, it's the percent of the total per year. Yep. Okay. But uh, also, it's not only the, the percentage or image, it's also sunk length. So, so in the Gulf of Mexico, it's like from, uh, from March to September, so the, it's, the sunk length is favorable for oil detection. While in October to March, it's not favorable for oil detection. So it's a seasonality. You mentioned thin thickness and thick thickness. Uh -huh. Is that the difference between crude oil and emulsion, or is it something else? No. That's so, another boundary to know. Okay. Yeah, I will show you okay, another slide. Know, I think I understand. So it's, it's from the bond agreement. Oh. So this uh, thin oil is using the sheen bond. While thick oil are using the metallic uh, this uh, range. So it's, it's a color code of of this uh, oil, crude oil. So are you actually, actually able to see a spectral response in the sheen range at the like 0 0.04, 0 0.05? No. So it's only from the <coughs> dampening effect or the sound length. Yeah, would there be any effect of using detergent during a spill on the overall findings here? Or detergent or non-detergent doesn't really influence really what's happening at the surface? You mean uh, this person? This person, yeah. Yep. So this, uh, so this technique is, you, this is a surface oil. If you're using this person, so it's a totally like, it's, um, it's signal from the water quantum. So that's different from the surface measurement. Yeah. So it will have a different reflectance. Yeah. Yep. So to be fair, most of the person's already used that before. They are. People are hard to use Other questions? Let's go ahead and give a hand. Thank you. We'll take a five minute break and then it's the committee members to reconvene and anyone else that wants to. Thank you very much. Yeah.